given the, the threat of catastrophic climate change, we really need to be rethinking our whole attitude towards, um, towards air travel. And we have got a very short space of time now in which to put in place the measures to really drastically reduce emissions and tackle, and tackle climate change. And I, I ask, we're looking at all other, all other sectors, the way we heat our homes, the way we power our industry, the way we, the way we drive our cars, the type of cars we drive, how much we use them. All these sort of, all these sort of questions are, are in the mix. So why on earth should aviation be left out of the equation as somehow being a sacred cow that's untouchable? It is the fastest growing contribution to um, greenhouse gas emissions. We absolutely cannot be expanding airports uh, uh, and building new runways and just accommodating the increase in passengers. Um, we really need to be actually taking steps to reduce the number of flights. So we need to be saying absolutely no more expansion in the, um, in the UK of air travel, and we need to be looking at the, at the alternatives. One of the arguments about tourism and the impact on the economy and, um, and so on. There was, a, there was a study commissioned by the GLA a couple of years ago which showed that the average British tourist spent more money abroad when they went on holiday than the average foreign tourist spent in, in Britain. So by making it easier for people to fly out of the country, we're actually harming the British economy. We're actually harming our own um, tourism potentials. We do need some very, very clear public policy measures in place. We need to be saying no more to airport expansion. We need carbon rationing. We need to ensure that the price of air travel reflects the, um, the true environmental cost. Wh one thing I'll say that we don't need is, and which you won't hear from me, is politicians just preaching at, at people. What we do need is practical public policy measures that will work in drastically reducing the level of flights and ensuring that aviation no longer contributes more and more greenhouse gas emissions because it's completely unsustainable the way we're going at the moment. It does seem to me that one can't discuss the future of anything unless it's within, against a background of appreciating how significant is the issue of climate change. We are on a trajectory towards the extinction of life on Earth and turning away from it, looking the other way, crossing our fingers, placing our faith in technology or greater efficiency or goodwill or better understanding or more information will not work. The problem with going about it in a democratic way is the implications of a democratic approach, which is that if the majority are not prepared to support a particular policy, a government can't do it. Well, I was writing about this 20 years ago, a warning that we were heading for a collision course between democracy and the future of the planet, and here we are 20 years later, and indeed that is what is happening. The, the, great majority of the public are not prepared to make the reductions that are necessary on a personal basis. They're just not prepared to. They are too addicted to energy-intensive lifestyles. So what do we do about it? Well, firstly, it is to recognise the gravity of the situation. Damn it, what do people want to hear to be happening before they take this issue seriously? You know, the, just a few days ago, the Met Office was putting out a statement saying that Africa is going to be harder hit than anywhere else, or, or much harder hit. Uh, look at Bangladesh, where the sea levels are already rising through their farmland. They can't go grow crops in them because of the salt deposits. One can look at the condition of the Inuits in, in, in the Arctic regions, uh, whose uh, the habitability of, of their culture is just it's melting literally below their feet. The glaciers are, uh, in the Himalayas are receding. Forest fires are breaking out at a much faster rate in South America in the rainforests. I could go on with a litany of the problems. What do you... Sorry, I get a bit aggressive at this point, but uh, what do you want to hear before you start screaming about the absolute inadequacy of government policy? Well, some of us, like myself, I've now got children and grandchildren, and I think to themselves, what will the world be like uh, when they are my age, my grandchildren? Uh, they, that, that will take them up to uh, 75. In 75 years' time, they will be my age. The world we know, we know, we know, will be in a far worse condition than it is now. Uh, and what are we doing about it? Talking about the freedom to fly, the freedom to see the world, when we know that corruption, the ecological corruption that that is 
and will inevitably cause our, our freedom so important to us to see the world, uh, to uh, go to a wedding or a funeral in another continent because of it being uh, uh, involving one's dear, nearest and dearest. The answer is a no, not yes, of course, in those circumstances. One can't interfere with people's rights uh, to do so. So the answer, because Abby's passed the note, and I've only got a minute, 50 seconds left now. Bloody hell. Um, no, I mean, it is ridiculous to oblige one to talk. The, the most urgent issue the world has ever faced and to be obliged to uh, shorten the time. You know, we've only got a few seconds left to talk about it so that we can head off to bite into a sandwich. It's, it, sorry, I, I, I really feel dismayed about the, about the procedure and I'm not making a point about you. But just to shorten, shorten the line of reasoning, I've got a, a lots of lines of reasoning here. The only, 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 <coughs> and inevitable way of resolving this problem is by the introduction of carbon rationing. Uh, the, the climate scientists have told us how much more it emissions that we can go on burning because it, it, the atmosphere has a finite capacity uh, not to, to, to absorb further emissions without the uh, climate being seriously destabilised. It's already showing strong evidence uh, uh, that, that it is being destabilised. Uh, destabilised. Uh, but um, so we know what is the finite capacity. How do you share that that finite capacity across the population of the world? Well, on an unequal basis, of course not. On an equal per capita basis. Now, where we come in in answer, and I'm finishing the very quickly, where we come in on this in relation to flying is, of course, that everybody's given the same annual ration, uh, and uh, if your ration doesn't stretch uh, to you still going on flying, you will be obliged to buy on the open market the price of people who are living within the ration and therefore have got a surplus to sell. Uh, the ration has got to be so phenomenally small that the price of that will be beyond the well, beyond the pockets of even rich people. I can assure you of this. Now, just finish up on a quick <laughs> statistic to make it in relation to flying. The average person, the average person in this country is responsible for the emission of between 11 and 12 tonnes of CO2 uh, per, that is, per person, 11 to 12. We have got to get down to something like a half the round flight from London to New York is, um, is between three and four tonnes, so that's sort of close on six to eight times your annual ration. Now, don't just block your ears and hope that somehow this, this uh, true harsh fact will fade away and that bastard Mayor Hillman will get out of the room so that we can go on engaging in these activities to which we're in, it, 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 so addicted. It's got to stop now, as the, 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 the surviving thought is, of course, that if you know it is so essential for you to go to your son's wedding or to your aunt's funeral or something like that, then you can do so, but you will have to pay a phenomenal price. In my five minutes, I want to sort of take a step back, really, perhaps to try and begin to consider why flying has become such a focus of environmental concern. Because I think in recent years, foreign travel is no longer the, the preserve of the rich. And travel allows people to fulfill their ambitions, is the way that I want to argue this. It's a key feature of modern society, uh, mobility and flying in particular. Yet it sits uncomfortably with some of the influential ideas which Darren and, and Maya have discussed. In our everyday lives, it's probably very difficult to think of another activity that so dramatically demonstrates the power and control we have over nature. So if you think about it, that's why you know you'll often see plane spotters at airports um, hanging around and looking at looking at the planes in wonder. And I think this is what drives and motivates the anti-flying arguments that it is such a powerful example of, of of modernity. Ultimately, flying has created a more cosmopolitan society. Um, it's vastly increased the possibilities for human social interaction. Globally, as a as as people, we're uh, more social as a result of the increased opportunities that travel and particular uh, cheap air travel ha ha has given us. This conference is an example of something where many of the speakers and I'm sure many of the, the attendees have flown from, from other places to participate in something which is, which is social and uh, has a purpose. Perhaps my fellow panellists will agree that the, the, my, with my positive take on flying, but counter with the argument, as we've heard, that the impacts caused by airline emissions cancel out any gains through travel. And I think, you know, we have to be honest, the defenders of travel here, they have a point. Aircrafts pollute, 
and they are hefty carbon emitters. But uh, the environmental argument is that damage caused by avian outweighs its benefits. I want to suggest the opposite. So my suggestion is that the carbon emitted by flying is a price worth paying for the enlarged humanity that we become. The consequences, we need to find solutions for, and we need to deal with them um, in their own terms. For the environmentalists, or the green outlook, and the sort of ruling uh, elites, if you like, of society, are reorganising our lives around climate change, uh, rather than attempting to solve the impacts of climate change, and that's the dominant impulse. When the government announced um, considering banning uh, short-haul uh, flights in the UK and counterbalancing that with an extensive rail network from London to Scotland, environmentalists opposed that as well. Uh, environmentalists have often said, no, no, we're not against travel, because if we, if we could use uh, railway systems for travel, we'd fully support that. But as soon as the government announced uh, extending railway networks in the UK as a balance against short-haul flights, environmentalists complained about that as well. I mean, what kind of... Uh, travel would you allow? Donkeys? Penny farthings? Could you kind of uh, alight on what kind of travel you'd actually support? Because I get the impression that you're more against travel per se than you are just about uh, flights. Maya uh, asked what kind of consequences we want to see before we start taking climate change seriously and uh, I think the three that he started out with were uh, forest fires and uh, Greenland uh, melting making life hard for the uh, Inuit there and the sea levels rising in Bangladesh. Uh, well, you know, I would suggest that actually when weighed against the benefits of flying, uh, you know, those are relatively minor problems. <laughs> yeah, well, we disagree, but I think that this is an important discussion to have out because it's not something which uh, is self-evident. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I would suggest that insofar as those things are problems, reducing carbon dioxide emissions is probably about the uh, least... Uh, effective way that you could try and deal with a problem like spreading of forest fires, you know, compared to uh, uh, investment taking control uh, of the forest, better forestry management, better firefighting and so forth. I mean, it's just a kind of bizarre way to think. Problem forest fires, you know, less flying, as if that's a, a way to kind of deal with that problem. And the benefits from flying are real. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, our grandchildren, what kind of life will uh, they have uh, 100 years from now? Well, I would suggest that a world which is more mobile, a world in which you know, we now begin to build up more global connections, in which we build a, a global culture, will be one which you know, they uh, inherit the benefits of that. You know, for them to live uh, in a more global world, in a more global culture, you know, that will be something positive that, that we will pass on to them. Uh, and just very finally, uh, you know, you attack the idea that, uh, you know, having faith in technology will uh, take us forward and, and take us, uh, kind of solve these sorts of problems and that nothing's changed in 20 years. Well, certainly in the last 20 years it's become uh, clear and it's been demonstrated that it's possible to uh, make synthetic fuels and biofuels on which airplanes can fly. You know, that, that is a, a real advance which was not clear 20 years ago. So it seems to me that the technological problem has been reduced to one of investment in greater energy supply and clean energy. If we can uh, make clean energy through technological means, whether that's uh, renewables, nuclear, carbon capture, whatever, uh, you know, we can make synthetic fuels for aircraft. You know, we've got some decades to sort out this problem. Uh, and yes, I have uh, plenty of faith in technology. Thanks. I just want to build on that last point because I do think the debate sometimes gets um, framed as if it's a zero-sum debate. Um, and it does seem to me that it is ironic that in conversations like this we, we often cite the, the, the importance of making sort of modal shifts in transport from things like flight to, uh, to things like, like trains and so on. Though, of course, 100 years ago we wouldn't have actually made that sort of assumption. And so in terms of the, in terms of the last speaker's point about, um, uh, about sort of uh, the improvements of technology, I mean, it does seem to me to be ironic, Darren, for example, that you talk about reducing levels of flight where you wouldn't, I presume, talk about like, sort of reducing levels of people living in homes. What you'd be talking about would be like, the way that those homes um, were engineered and the way that people lived in those homes. Um, so I'd really like you to comment on this whole thing about reducing this to a zero-sum game. But in fact, what you're talking about is a sort of a political solution, and you did write at the beginning of your uh, talk, uh, really emphasise the fact that you don't think it's important to sort of preach to people, but actually rather engage people in a conversation like this. 
Um, uh, just from my point of view, I think this demonstrates nicely the two sorts of greens we have. We have uh, the friendly greens and the um, angry greens. And the friendly greens make lots of ephemeral points, like Britons going to foreign countries and spending more money than people coming here, when you assume that perhaps more people come here because there are six billion people in the world and only 60 million Britons. And, and then why average, should we only care, only care about our British economy and not foreign economies, and would they spend the money at home? And all these points that can come from that, but it was just a nice sort of tangibly nice point, but once you look at it, then it's really not as strong, perhaps, but maybe you're going to prove me wrong, hopefully. Um, and then you've got the one where you've got the draconian idea of reducing our carbon emissions by, well, to about 5% of what we currently have, um, which I don't think is going to happen, or most reasonable people won't do reasonably because they don't want to, and you won't be able to stop democracy taking control, I think, quite probably. Um, so why, why don't we discuss sort of nuclear power, why don't we discuss the, the idea of banks? We've got the people who don't want to give anything to flight or travel. We've got the people who are trying to make us feel all right but trying to warn us at the same time. And um, why don't we talk about, you know, companies, high-flying individuals? How are we going to address all of them? Why don't we talk about why flight is such a small percentile contributor to the overall greenhouse emissions? Uh, why are we talking about doubling in size rather than its overall percentile contribution? And why do we have to either be draconian or really nice? Why can't we engage people in the argument, give us some hard facts, and tell us some things that we actually may do, rather than things that we're just going to vomit at and then run away screaming and not worry about? First question was about, um, am I anti-travel? Um, no, I, I think the, the Channel Tunnel is a fantastic invention. I think it's fantastic to be able to get into, uh, into Europe um, by rail rather than, rather than by flying. I enjoy going to, um, enjoy going to Europe. In terms of um, domestic, fl domestic flights in, in the UK, I am very, very keen that we upgrade our, our rail network so people can get around, um, get around this country efficiently and cheaply. It's about the right sort of travel in terms of the, the point over there. Would you reduce the number of people um, living in homes? Clear clearly not, but... Um, there are issues about we've taken steps, we've taken public policy measures in London to reduce the level of traffic coming into central London because of the impact that that had on people's health, on the emissions and um, on the environment, on congestion and, and so on. So we've had a congestion charge, we've had a public policy measure that actually works in terms of, um, in terms of shaping and changing people's behaviour. And I am interested in, in public policy measures. I'm not interested in preaching at people or screaming at people and making them, making them vomit or whatever because I don't think it works. I am interested in practical public policy measures that, um, that really work. And just in, in terms of the, uh, the, the point about um, flight, I mean, I think a, a flight to a, a faraway place, so it can be a life-changing experience for people, but I don't think you need to have those sort of life-changing ones, you know, those life-changing experiences every year or several times a year or whatever. I'm not saying no one should ever fly anywhere ever under any, under any conditions at all. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I am saying we actually need to reduce the number of flights and we need some clear public policy measures to actually reduce the number of flights to ensure that we have a sustainable aviation industry in this country, not the unbelievably unsustainable one at present. I don't think there's anything wrong with preaching, as long as that preaching is informed by a moral position. It is only as a result of government interceding where the public interest is not served by the aggregation of people doing what they believe they're prepared to do, providing it doesn't hurt, hurt too much. The government has that obligation to intercede. It did against the threat of fascism. The threat of ecological disaster is far, far greater than fascism, I can assure you, and to imply somehow uh, that the democratic process can survive. Had there been a referendum in 1939 as to whether to go to war with Nazi Germany uh, only 19 years or 20 years after uh, the end of the First World War, I can assure you that referendum would have been lost. 
that uh, observation, I think, that you, was it you who made it about Bangladesh, you know, that you think that flying is more important than any uh, problems that that may uh, bring about with, with, with regard to people who suffer from it. Yeah. I think that is such an outrageous, really, really outrageous point of departure. They are the victims, so the, the fact that their arable land is being inundated and, and, and uh, is our fault, it's the fault of the West by burning uh, fossil fuels with gay abandon. And the second outcome, if it's not that, is uh, that when the chips are down, we don't really care about the future. I just want to knock this um, example of Africa and Bangladesh on the head. Because um, what's essentially happened through the environmental narrative is that poverty... Um, and disease have become naturalized. Um, and that's a problem, okay? Um, as far as I'm concerned, they're social problems that, which are susceptible to social solutions. Um, what the environmental narrative does is naturalize poverty. So it's going back to a 19th century notion of poverty caused in some way by natural conditions, um, and therefore, you know, we're unable to solve it. Um, I thought we'd moved on from that. You know, I'm, I'm a left winger, you know. It's a social problem which is susceptible to social solutions. Yeah, even though Darren's sort of caged it in, in sort of more moderate terms, he shares Mayer's really degraded view of what human beings are actually capable of. Because we heard it from Mayer over and over again that Bangladeshis and people who live in the third world are victims, right? So they can't change their own circumstances. Um, and that's one thing that flying does really well. It allows people to not only change their own circumstances, but change the circumstances of those people who live in the same countries as them. I mean, Bangladesh is one country who has an economy built on remittances, right? People going away and sending money back. So the question is, my question for Maya and Darren really, is why do you have this idea of human beings that they're, they're happy to just sit in their own filth, um, wait for what they get from the West, and, and why not actually endorse their opportunity to make a, a better life for themselves, as opposed to thinking that it's something we have to do for them? Uh, thanks. Um, just following on from Pete's point about um, how we're kind of naturalising poverty, I think it's even worse than that because... I think um, Mayor Hillman's suggestion for carbon rationing really exposes the barbarism of um, radical environmentalism because it's a recipe for the enslavement of the third world. Because if you give everyone in the world the same carbon rations, it sounds very equal, but it's not. Because in those societies where people do not have the choice to emit carbon, for example, they can't fly, they can't drive, they can't work in a factory, they will have no choice but to sell their rations onto other people. Uh, to wealthier people, people in the West. So, in fact, a carbon rationing system would codify and intensify poor people's inferior subordinate relationship with Westerners. It's a form of eco-enslavement. And I think it's important to point out that the Green Party, uh, although they sound much more moderate, support precisely the same form of barbarism. And that's why I think this kind of denigration of human interest, this kind of uh, codification of the divide between the West and the, and the Third World, this kind of celebration of poverty, although you don't put it like that, you claim to speak on their behalf, really shows the way in which environmentalism degrades human interests and human ambitions, which is, is why I think the technology debate is not good enough. But what we need to get beyond, it, beyond the technology debate and put the case for uh, satisfying human desire and satisfying humans' needs and then have a subsequent discussion about how technology can facilitate that. I want to pick up on a couple of kind of facts and figures to start with. I mean, one thing is that although, uh, I, I mean, this gentleman here is right, it, flight is a very small proportion of uh, global emissions uh, at the moment. I think it's about the same as what you get from computing, in fact. Uh, and the reason why it's easy to point the finger at, for example, a flight to and from New York is that although per passenger mile, flight is reasonably efficient, modern commercial jets, if they're full, are about as efficient as, as a motor car. Um, but obviously they cover a lot more miles. You do a lot more miles when you go to New York than when you go to Bristol. Uh, so that's why it's very easy to point the fingers at flight. Um, so that basically means that if you want to travel long distances, flight is the only sensible way to go. Um, and I know Darren kind of wants to have his cake and eat it too. So they go, oh, well, you know, you can have your one life-changing experience, but not too many. Don't go too mad. One life-changing experience should be enough for anyone. Uh, <laughs> But I think the fact is, people want to fly, and Willie Walsh is probably right, it's probably nerds like me that actually like the fact of flying, but people want to fly, and the passenger numbers have gone up until the last couple of years. Um, with the recession, they've started to backtrack a bit in the UK, but people travelling to visit their friends and relations is continuing to rise. People want to go and visit the people that they know and love. 
And that's what they want to do. So this is where I really think it comes down to the crux of it, and flight is about freedom. And, you know, I admire you, May, because you are frank and honest, and you say, if it's a choice between democracy and environmental limits on what people can do, I choose environmental limits. And if my grandchildren grow up in a world that is only two degrees warmer and is not a democracy, then that's what I want for them. But I have to say, that is not what I want for the people of that generation. I would rather they grew up into a world that was a bit warmer, but there was a democracy and where everyone was as much better off as we are than our relatives 75 years ago. And people in Bangladesh have more options because they're better off. And if that means that the world is a warmer place and some polar bears have to live in zoos, well, tough. Um, I think a lot of discussions around transport are, are, and design around transport are usually about behaviour modification, changing one form of behaviour to another one, rather than liberating a whole range of behaviours. Um, and the other point I had to make was, is it any wonder that people don't buy into this when it's painted in such catastrophic and final terms? Uh, you know, no wonder people don't believe that the way that they behave has any, conse you know, has any consequence. Truthfully, I, I'm so dismayed by the nature of the questions that have come because it seems to me that, that, uh, that they're ignoring their harsh truth. I mean, I, when I said to you that the round flight from London to New York is uh, um, uh, uh, between three and four tonnes, which is way in excess of what's got to be the annual ration for all fossil fuel using purposes, did you just block your ears and pretend I hadn't said it? I said it, and I also related it to the figure that's got to be. And to imply, as one of the other uh, uh, speakers did, that somehow or other, uh, you know, what we need to do is to enable... Uh, third world to increase its prosperity and, and, and the situation of their own populations, presumably through the medium of economic growth, uh, when growth is the principal contributor to climate change in the first place. I, I might have lost faith in democracy if the, uh, this room represented the entire makeup of the, uh, the British nation. I might be feeling a bit, more, uh, a bit more jaded. But I do have faith in the democratic process to deliver. I do believe that um, our um, political leaders need to show real leadership and real bravery on this. That does not mean having a referendum on every single on every single issue. If Ken Livingstone had had a referendum on congestion charging before it was introduced, it would have been it would have been lost. But I do have faith in the democratic system. Well, where I agree with uh, Darren and even Mayor actually is is, is that we have a choice. Um, humans are adaptable uh, creatures, um, and we can stop flying. And arguably, you could arg actually argue there'd be some benefits from that. You know, I wouldn't have to go to work so frequently, so I could stay at home. You know, I'd get to know my neighbours better. I'd live in a more localised community. Um, and for a while, um, you know, we might actually be happier. And all this is possible, and it's a choice that we could make. But my feeling, and this is what, you know, my feeling is that we would just be smaller people as a consequence.